What's up YouTube, what's going on guys? So um, I'm gonna film a deadlift tutorial here. I actually filmed this the other day and just for you guys I'm refilming it because it came out really shaky and my auto stabilizer wasn't on. But what we're gonna be talking about today is total body tensioning or even distribution of tension in the system in the deadlift and why that's extremely important to make your deadlift as optimal as possible uh, while simultaneously ensuring your glutes are the prime mover. Whether you're a sumo or conventional puller, the glutes are the powerhouse, the rest of the tension is distributed evenly in a secondary fashion to the rest of the body. The back is more of a support system than anything. It's definitely not a prime mover. The glutes are the prime mover. The hamstrings are a prime mover with the glutes. Uh, the quads are kind of a secondary mover, especially in breaking the floor. For sumo deadlifts, it's a little bit different. The quads are more of a primary mover. Today, I'm going to be demonstrating a conventional pull, but mostly everything I say can be uh, carried over to the sumo as well. Um, so what we're going to talk about first, there's a lot of things we got to go over, a lot of categories to achieve total body tensioning or even distribution of tension along with uh, making sure the glutes are the prime mover and nothing else is going out of whack. Whenever you see someone's back really giving out or their knees cave in or you see funky movement patterns, it's usually an issue um, that can be fixed with something I'm gonna mention here. And that the issue with things like getting your glutes to fire in a deadlift, it's more than just activation drills or strength imbalances. Everything from your bodily positions to the toe flare, to uh, activation, to cues, to force transfer, all these things play a huge role. The first thing we're gonna talk about is bodily positions. Whether, what you have to understand is your low back and your pelvis will control the amount um, of tension your glutes can provide to the deadlift. If you are flexed over at all or if you're too hyperextended, in either of those states, the glutes can't contract as hard as they can when that back is in a neutral position. So before we even talk about anything, you have to ensure you're able to get down and go ahead and come over to the side view. More than anything, you have to ensure that you're able to get down into a neutral low back position. So when you're starting, you don't want to start flex. You want to ensure you can actually start like this. And the issue conventional pullers have is oftentimes they actually can't even get into a neutral back position. If that's you, if you can't get into that position in the start, what I would encourage you is to one, work on your bracing. I have videos on that. But two, mobilize into deep hip flexion. Uh, I'm going to splice some clips over, but I've talked about these mobility drills before. What you need to achieve is essentially better hip flexion mobility. Oftentimes when we see people trying to get into a hip flexion, state, especially when the femurs are getting close to the chest, we lose posterior hip capsule space and that butt wants to tuck. It's kind of like if you were doing a hanging leg raise and you bring your knees to your chest, what happens? That butt tucks under the closer we get. So we have to ensure we can go into that hip flex position with a nice neutral back. So first step is mobility. Once you've achieved that, the next step is rigidity. We need to maintain that neutral back position. And part of that is from cueing, ensuring you're nice and neutral in the, the lift, but that's pretty simple stuff. The other part is huge, it's the bracing. And I've talked about this a thousand times on my channel. I have other videos specifically on a deadlift brace. Go watch those, that'll help you achieve the low back neutrality, which allows you to use these glutes. So that's number one. Now the second bodily position we have to talk about is your foot width and the toe flare. These are kind of the same thing, but slightly different. So essentially, whenever we go wider, it allows us to contribute the glutes and hamstrings more, the hip extensors, and whenever we're a little bit more narrow, it allows the quads to actually produce force more. Now this might mess with your brain a little bit because if you think sumo, a lot of people know uh, sumo deadlift puts a bigger demand on the quads, and that is true due to the range of motion at the knee joint. Because you are bent over more and more flex at the knee, now the quads have to contribute more. But what you need to understand is when you're out here, it's hard for your quads to fire. Think about when you're doing uh, a, like a high bar kind of narrow stance squat. What do you feel? Your quads. When you go real wide and hips back, what do you feel? Your ass. So there, there is truth that there is more demand on the quads due to the range of motion at the knee joint, but it also feels even harder because you're in a bad position to produce force with the quads. We get lateral force transfer, force going out to the sides. So it's actually a, even more glute dominant as well when you sumo deadlift. A conventional deadlift has little demand on the quads because they're less bent, but because you're in this straight position with your femurs going straight into the ground, a nice straight line stacked over the heel joints, you're able to produce vertical force straight down. And this allows us to drive those quads into the ground hard. So generally speaking, the wider you go, the more your hips can contribute, but you get less of that quad drive. And this is something you kind of have to play with to find your perfect position to ensure that we get enough pop from the quads, but also enough activation from the glutes. I know a lot of people who think they're real strong in a very narrow kind of conventional because they get a huge pop off the ground, but then all of a sudden they lose glute drive, their back flexes over and they have a hard time at lockout. 
you might find that if you go a little bit wider, you're gonna get more drive from the hips, maybe a little less pop off the floor, but you're gonna be in a better position, okay? So play with the, the width. The other thing you need to take into consideration is anatomy. Someone like Brian Shaw is a good example of a conventional puller who pulls very wide. He's also six foot nine and as wide as a house. The guy's a huge, huge individual. So if you look at his start position, his feet are not much more outside hip width. They are a little bit, but I mean, speaking objectively, he's super wide in his conventional stance and it looks strange on, on uh, film, but that's due to his anatomy. So usually the more narrow your hips are, the more you can bring these in. I like to start people at about hip width for their conventional pole, and then I play with it and try to fine tune their perfect uh, position. Generally speaking, we want an even amount of distribution. We want some pop off the floor, but we want to ensure our back can stay neutral and the glutes can drive. The next thing you got to talk about is toe flare. I did a whole video on this, which was kind of the intro to this video. I would encourage you to go watch that. But in short, basically the more we turn the toes out, the more the hips can rotate out and contribute glute contraction. However, you can take this too far. If we go too duck footed, now we lose our center of gravity a little bit, our feet are turned out, we have balance issues. And on top of that, the quads can't contribute much. And if you go way too out, the glutes will actually shut off because we can't actually actively twist the feet into the ground. So toe flare needs to be there. The more turned out your hips are naturally or retroverted like myself, the more we're gonna point the toes out and the more you're kind of internally rotated or antiverted in your hips, the more you're gonna to be toes forward in your conventional deadlift stance, okay? Um, but play with this, go watch that other video, I have a lot of tips there. And then once you're there, what you need to think about are some cueing things which we'll talk about later. The next two bodily positions we gotta talk about, the first one is how the knees trek um, laterally to the outside of the foot. So what we want to ensure whenever we're pulling our deadlift is that the knees never kick in. I talk about this in the toe flare video too. If we see the knees kick in like this as we're pulling, it means the quads are doing too much and the glutes are shutting off. The glutes are both the hip extender, bringing the hips to the bar, and they're also a rotator, an external rotator of the hips. So if they're fully active, we should actually see the hips kind of open up as we pull. I'll splice some clips over the screen and you'll see me and my girlfriend when we pull conventional, you can see us really getting those knees out to the side. I'll talk about a cue later that helps with that. So whenever you're pulling, the main thing you gotta remember is the lateral aspect of the knee should be tracking with the lateral aspect of the foot. Likewise, the middle aspect of the knee should track over the middle aspect of the foot. If it comes in from that, that means you got an issue with glute drive and you either need to alter your position on the bar or really cue uh, screwing your feet to the ground, which I'll talk about later. So that's the first one. The second bodily position, go ahead and come over here. The second bodily position we need to talk about is knee recession, or essentially making sure our knees stay forward until the right time. In a conventional deadlift, the knees and hips should lock out at the same time. And what we want to see is the knee actually stays forward and never receives until the bar needs to pass it. Whenever we see those knees recede early, that means the quads are shutting off. And the problem with this is usually it puts too much demand on the hip extensors and low back, and that's when we see the low back flex over, and then the glutes have a really hard time contributing. So even distribution of tension, we want everything to work at some point, otherwise if you shift too much of that tension to one or two muscle groups, everything's gonna fall apart. You're only as strong as your weakest link. So whenever I see people pull, the first thing I look for is some slight knee recession. Now the thing is, you gotta look closely for this. Sometimes you think your knees are staying forward, but if you look at the film, you can see they're actually receding more than you realize. So you gotta look at your, your footage really close, but what you wanna see is when you're in this position and you're pulling, those knees never shift back. They always stay forward until the bar clears and the hips and knees lock out at the same time. If we ever see those knees push back before that bar is clearing past the knee, it's a big sign the quads are shutting off and you're doing too much with the hips and not driving enough with the legs into the ground. Now along with that, this is why I got my SPD knee sleeves as shin guards right now as I'm demonstrating these poles. You always have to maintain contact with the bar on the shin. And someone who pulls like me where I really wedge my hips under the bar, I actually almost aggressively pull this bar into my shins and drag it up a little bit. I don't ramp it up my, my quads or my shins or anything, but I really make sure it's always dug into my shins. I actually have a bunch of scars all over my knees from years of doing this without knee sleeves and just rubbing over there. But whenever we see that bar shift away, it may not actually be the knees receding, but now you're just starting with the bar too far away from your system. 
For every little quarter of an inch that bar moves away from you, that's more demand on your hip extensors, the quad extensor, everything. Everything is gonna take more demand, so we always want to ensure we have the best leverage, and that bar is always maintaining position against the shins the entire way up. If we see that bar lose position, it's either the quad shutting off, or you're letting it drift away because you're not staying tight, and that's gonna screw up the entire uh, kinetic chain as we pull. Now the next thing we have to talk about is force transfer in the deadlift. Whenever we transfer force, we want to ensure it's actually happening evenly the entire time. One of the biggest mistakes I see in the deadlift is people yank on the bar and they produce a shit ton of force, but then their position and the whip from the bar loses all that force transfer and you get some unstable kind of looking pull and then the system falls apart. That's why I'm so big on pulling out the slack. I think everyone should pull out the slack. Even if you feel stronger when you don't and you yank, you are producing more force that way, but you're probably not getting that force actually produced into the bar and moving the weight the way we need to. And the way you're gonna do this is picking the slack out. I have videos on this before, but I'm gonna demonstrate it again. What you need to do is get down into position. There's a few different ways of doing this, but this is how I like to do it. You're gonna grip the bar and literally lift up on it as you receive the knees and kind of get into a hip shoot. So I'm lifting my hips back. And what I'm thinking is I'm actually literally pulling up as I'm doing this. I'm not forward over it. I'm not just doing this. I'm like actually pulling up and then I set back with it, okay? So I'm taking that empty slack, I'm picking it up and then I lean back and as I set my hips back, I start driving into the ground. So it's all kind of one continuous motion and this allows me to get that empty slack out of the bar to ensure there's force transfer. The way to think about this is imagine you had a giant cinder block right here in front of you and you had to move it across the room. Would you step back here and try to produce all the force and run at it? No way, because if you do that, you're gonna hit that thing. One, it's gonna hurt, but two, you know that force is just gonna hit a dead wall and half of it's not gonna actually get in there. What you would do instead is get up on the cinder block, wedge yourself in, and then start pushing like that, and that's better force transfer. Same thing on the bar. If we just yank up and we hit that dead wall, we lose force transfer. So again, down here, slack up, and you can see here, because the weight's so light, it actually picked up off the floor, and then I set back with it. And if you do this right, most of you won't even be able to warm up with just a plate anymore. You have to start around a plate in 85, so like 185 if you're a girl, or a guy 225, or like me, I've gotten so good at this and my strength is uh, uh, up there in the deadlift. I started about 315 now in the deadlift as my warm up set because that's the only way I can pull out the slack. Now the last thing we need to talk about are cues to achieve everything we just talked about. The first one we're gonna go over is ensuring that knee tracks that lateral aspect of the foot. This is where I really like to cue full foot contact as well as screw driving the feet into the ground. This is huge. So regardless if you're more of a toe flare deadlifter like me or a very toe forward deadlifter, none of that matters. What you need to think about is your heel, your big toe and your pinky toe are all in contact with the ground. And wherever your start position is, whether it's out here or here, I want you to twist those into the ground and actually create almost an artificial arch in your foot. Especially people who have flat feet, this is gonna ensure you get your glutes active while ensuring your big toe, heel, and pinky toe are down. Now, if you don't think about that big toe, what's gonna happen when you do this is oftentimes the feet are gonna to wanna to come up to the sides like this. So we start twisting so much, that almost happens and that's not gonna be good for force transfer. We want the entire foot on the ground because again, whenever we produce force, we wanna transfer as much as possible. Could you produce more force by pushing with your finger here or your entire hand? What I'm pushing with has the same amount of energy behind it. It's what instrument is going into the object I'm trying to push. That's what's gonna dictate how much force transfer gets put into the object, okay? So we don't want just a little piece of contact. We want that entire foot on the ground driving through. So you're gonna stand in your position and watch my feet here. What I'm gonna cue, and I do this the entire time during the concentric, eccentric, everything. I twist my feet into the ground. You can see here, if you look closely, my foot wants to come up, but because I keep that big toe down, it creates a nice little arch in here. I actually have pretty flat feet from all the years of lifting. So whenever I twist here, and really keep that big toe down, it gives me a nice little arch, and that ensures I'm keeping those glutes active and the knees driving out. Now, if you're more toes forward, your knees aren't gonna be budging out as much as mine, but again, it's that lateral aspect of the knee tracks over the lateral aspect of the foot. That's cue number one. Now, cue number two is gonna be about wedging your ass underneath your shoulders. I always like to think of it as a wedge because you want your momentum going back because that's gonna help you lean back and actually use leverage to lift the weight while simultaneously getting glute drive. I see so many people mess up their deadlifts because they pull it and they end like over here instead of back and their momentum's going forward. 
Just like if you had a huge, heavy, awkward object on the ground and you just had to lift that thing a little bit, a few inches off the ground, would you stand over it and try to pick it up like this? Definitely not. You're going to lean back and use your momentum going back. Same thing in the deadlift, okay? So we're going to get here. We're going to twist the feet. And once you're going, what I want you to think is you're trying to lean back while squeezing your butt through. And that's going to wedge your hips under you. So you're going to go through your brace. Neutral back. And that was dramatic, but I wanted to show it on camera. I don't actually lean back that much, but that's essentially what I'm trying to do. So again, I'm going to twist the feet, brace. You can see how I have that lean and that active glute. I'm trying to literally force my hips and thrust my hips through underneath my shoulders. I'm wedging my ass. It's kind of like a deadlift jack. I'm leaning back while squeezing my glutes through. Give me a sec. This is the last one. Nine. <laughs> it's tiring demonstrating shit. Or I'm so shit. The last cue that's going to help you is going to help lock in the back and make sure that's neutral so the glutes and quads and everything can do what they need to do. And that's going to be from the shoulders. So a lot of people kind of laugh at my deadlift setup because it looks like I'm about to go stomp the yard and I get my arms all long and my lats all tight. But what I'm doing is I'm trying to ensure my scapula is locked in, my lats are engaged in depression, my arms are as long as possible. So when I start, I don't get any power leaks. Whenever we see that back round over and give, then usually the low back gives, then the glutes can't fire, and you're getting some weird jerky deadlifts. And when you're not maxing out, you can probably lock out those deadlifts, but go max out, watch what happens, and then in five years, tell me how your spine's feeling. What we want to do is ensure that doesn't leak, okay? Especially if you pull with flexion. I actually am someone, I have a little bit of back flexion when I pull. Most conventional power lifters do, uh, or most conventional pullers who power lift do. But what you want to ensure is it doesn't change position as you're pulling, okay? So when I do, as I get up on the bar and I think big broad chest as I'm setting my brace and everything, but I take my shoulders and I put them back and down. The problem is everyone thinks, I've heard, you know, try to screwdrive your shoulders or put your shoulders in your back pocket. I don't like that because it, it all puts it in the shoulders. You want to think about your arm length too and you really want the shoulder to be as low as possible because when we pull, this bar is going to pull the arm as deep as it can. And if we start a little too hyped up and retracted, that arm is going to leak out. So you want to think, length, shoulders back and down, chest broad, you get all this neutral. So the way I do it is I get in here, get my feet positioned, twist, breathe out, brace, shoulders, arms, and everything locked in, down and back, and then I get down here, pull the slack out, and I go. So whenever I do that, it's long. And I really only do that on the first rep because once you get down into position for the subsequent reps, they're already going to be locked in place if you stay tight that entire time. That's pretty much it, guys. you got to treat the deadlift or the body in the deadlift as an entire system. If one thing fails, everything's going to fail. The glutes need to be the prime mover. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Give the video a thumbs up and share it. It really helps out. Until next time, guys, I'll see you later.